Hello, today we are interviewing Wolfgang Huber, son of resistant Kurt Huber and Professor Emeritus at the Catholic University of Eichstätt in Gorstadt. Professor Huber, welcome and thanks for being with us. Thank you. You came today to Ecole Polytechnique to give a conference about the White Wars movement. Your father, Kurt Huber, was a prominent figure of this movement and he got executed for it. Can you tell us a bit more about him and about the White Wars movement? Yes, of course. There are many people who think my father's subject, whose main subject, was the philosopher Leibniz. But I think this is not true. He worked in the jail on his last book, and that was about Leibniz. But Leibniz was not his primary subject. My father originally studied music. He studied acoustics, phonetics. Phonetics were very interesting for him. He built uh, ap special apparatus to form vowel sounds. And vowel theory was one of his subjects he uh, studied for the whole life. The day he was executed, he was writing on a paper on vowel theory. And in this paper, he started a letter to the family. Letters to families normally were not uh, given out of jail. But in that, ca in that case, my father wrote it on a scientific paper, and the police didn't have the nerve to study all these papers, so they put the whole chunk and gave it to my mother. So we had the, the letter in the original. And uh, this was on one part on uh, theory of vowel. So this was the main thing. And I think these are things that are almost forgotten and because that uh, he studied music and music was the center of his ideas. Now the wife Rose, um, you asked me, uh, there is also some sort of misunderstanding. And uh, I think the main problem is uh, the appropriation. So, um, for instance, in the uh, German Democratic Republic in the East, um, because one member of the White Rose had communist ideas, of course, in the East, the whole group were communists. And this was a communist movement. And of course, in the West, yes. And especially during the Cold War, you had always the problem. So the only man who declared himself to be a communist, he was neglected in the West, of course. On the other hand, the Catholic Church thought these are all Catholic martyrs, but most of them were Protestant or Orthodox or didn't believe in more or less nothing. So this again was some sort of appropriation. And uh, since the majority of the students were also in the military, some people said, well, that was military resistance. And nowadays we have the problem that we want to try to, to see them as individuals, to see them not with only one uh, opinion they had. Everyone had his own, its, his own opinions and his own uh, hierarchy of values, which is very important. And everyone <coughs> has some sort of moral ideas. They try to act morally according to their own moral standards. And I think this is the most important thing. You see in the exhibition, uh, so so to speak, biographies, small biographies of the people who did this. So you mentioned the exhibition. Ecole Polytechnique is hosting that exhibition at its library. It's open to all until October 2nd. Can you tell us why people should come and visit it? Oh, yes. The first thing is it's a fine thing that is open to all. So only young people and elderly people can see it. 
that's very important. Because for many people outside of Germany, Germany still is Nazi Germany. Nowadays, we hope we can show another part of Germany. We can show you a part of Germany that existed under very bad circumstances, but it did exist. There was resistance against Hitler. However, there was no resistance like in France. We didn't have a man like de Gaulle who could make a unification of all of these resistant movements. No, the resistant movements were rather isolated from each other. But I think it's worthwhile to look at, a, at an exhibition. The old people could think, well, Germany wasn't only Nazi Germany, we had also the mother parts. And the younger people could see, well, there is some moral obligation, maybe, even for me, even I could say, or could become into a situation where it might be reasonable to resist to anything, what it, whatever it is. So uh, maybe we want to be more informed about things and um, we see the infringement of the press and so on. So I think it's, it's useful to look at the exhibition. And you're speaking of resistance nowadays. Can you tell us in what ways, according to you, is the White Wars movement still meaningful for the modern world? I think it's very meaningful. So I think the basic idea of the White Rose was to fight for the freedom of expression, the freedom of the press, the freedom of opinion. I think this was the center of what they thought. What we want to do with the exhibition is to show that people who really want to fight for the freedom of the press, for the freedom of expression, they have to become alert. They have to become alert of many forms of infringement, of impinging the freedom of expression. It's not so simple. If you say, well, this country, the freedom of the press doesn't exist, fine. Some people have, some people do not have. But most of the people have the freedom of press, but only in a limited way. And you should be alert to find out where is the limitation? So for instance, in Turkey, uh, Turkey is a country that's formally democratic, but no other country has so many journalists in jail than Tur Turkey has. So this is a definite infringement of the freedom of the press. Uh, we see the neo-Nazi movement and so on. They all say, oh, the press lies. But which press lies about what? It's very difficult to find out, and uh, the young people should be alert. I think this is a very important thing, and uh, this makes it clear that it's useful to have such an exhibition. So you speak about young people, and we are here in a university. Ecole Polytechnique has, among its core values, integrity and responsibility. How can we foster these qualities in our engineering and scientific students? Yes, I think you already have, because so science usually has its own code of, um, has its own moral code. So for instance, it's impossible to plagiarize. So one doesn't do it. And if it does happen, there are, people wouldn't go immediately into jail, but there would be some, uh, some, uh, Shame about it. Yeah, yeah, of course. So plagiarize is, is a thing that's not done. Or if you describe an experiment, you have to describe it in a way that anyone else could repeat it. Or if you uh, say something is true and you cannot derive the truth from a generally accepted <coughs> excuse me, set of axioms, this again is against the moral code of science. But it's not only the laws of science that uh, are important. You also have um, some sort of responsibility uh, innate in science. Nowadays, science lives from money that comes from out, 
from outside. The state alone cannot finance a university like this. It's impossible. Uh, you need money that comes from outside, that comes from the industry. And of course, the industry might have some interest in the research you make. Now, there is something to decide between. It's not only the laws of the science, but it's also the responsibility of the researchers. And I think um, this is the place where you could really show the responsibility of the researchers. It's very, very interesting and extremely complicated. I have no solution, but I think to be alert to the possibility of a conflict might be enough. Thank you very much, Professor Uber, for being with us today. Thank you very much. It was very interesting to see you. <laughs>